Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the introduction to geospatial analysis in our webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. Um, while everybody is logging in, you, most of you have already noticed, but we do have two option, a uh, couple of optional polls at the bottom of your screen, and I'd like to thank you in advance for your feedback on these polls. It's 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. First, what I'd like to do is go over a few logistics with, related to our webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, participants have been placed in silent mode, but if you have any issues or you have any questions, please enter those into the Q&A pod, and you'll see that located on the right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted both to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. Once this has been completed, uh, what I'll do is I'll send an email to all of the registrants with the recording links. Regarding timing, today's webinar is one hour long with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and live demonstration and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. Once our speakers have finished with their presentations, we will transition to a final set of polling questions. And usually I'll give these a few minutes or so um, so people have an opportunity to you know, answer the questions. And then from there, we'll move directly to the Q&A period. Depending upon the volume of questions we receive today, we'll extend the Q&A an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 p.m. for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. During today's webinar, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Allison Boyer. She's the Chief Scientist at NASA's Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archive Center, or ORNL-DAC. She will, I'm gonna pull up today's agenda, actually, so you can take a look at what we're going to cover today. She will begin today's webinar with an introduction to the NASA ORNL DAC and a description of the data set as well as the paper associated with the use case that will be featured during the live demonstration. Today's second speaker is Dr. Jessica Welch. She is the Science Communications Lead at ORNL DAC, and she'll spend the second half of today's webinar with a live demo that will show you how to um, complete several tasks within R, such as how to import geospatial files, overlay layers, select and reclassify values, and then also make a map within the R Markdown environment. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Allison Boyer. Allison? Thank you very much, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Jessica and I are coming to you from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory DAC and NASA Data Center. The goals of today's webinar are to provide an introduction to the data available at our data center and to demonstrate methods to do geospatial operations in R, as Jennifer mentioned in the agenda. I want to call your attention to this link. Um, you can access the R tutorial for our demonstration today at this link, and I encourage you to do that either now or after the webinar is over. We also have some other tutorials available at our DAC. They involve um, a variety of different types of data, so I encourage you to check those out as well. Now, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archive Center is a data center that archives data from NASA's terrestrial ecology program. We also support carbon cycle data and ecosystems research that's funded by NASA. This word cloud at the bottom of the slide shows a variety of different keywords associated with the data in the Oak Ridge DAC. You can see we have a lot of data about land cover, carbon dioxide, biomass, leaf area index, and a variety of other environmental data. So if you're interested in environmental research, I encourage you to check out our website. The uh, link to our homepage is here. 
And on our homepage, we have all of the most recent data releases, as well as um, data access tools. Now, our data center supports research from NASA, and we've supported a variety of different projects over the past 25-year-plus uh, history. Uh, one of the most uh, biggest recent projects is the ABOVE experiment that's taking place in the Arctic and boreal regions of North America. We also support a variety of um, airborne data, including atom, uh, carbon monitoring in the um, Alaska with the CARVE project, and also soil moisture. Now, a lot of these data uh, can be classified into uh, different scientific themes. So on our homepage, we group data into these nine different uh, data themes. It includes um, Arctic data, data about biomass, uh, the carbon cycle, climate, fire, hydrology, land use, soils data, and vegetation and forest. The example data that we're going to share today comes from the carbon cycle and the vegetation uh, science theme. Now, as you can imagine, most of NASA's data about the Earth is geospatial in nature, meaning that it can be mapped. Uh, the data at Oak Ridge DAC um, are presented in a special tool we call the Spatial Data Access Tool. The link for that is here on the page. You can use this tool to easily browse or look at uh, geospatial data before you download it. So you don't even need R or ArcGIS to take a look at some of the spatial data we have in our data center. You can use this spatial data access tool to view the data and then to download it in a variety of different projections and formats to suit your needs. The Oak Ridge DAC hosts data in a variety of different formats. And I'm going to go over three different geospatial formats that are very common. The first of those is a shapefile. A shapefile can contain line, point, or polygon data. A polygon is just a shape. So this example shows the date of burning uh, across fire scars in Alaska. And you can see that the colors correspond to different dates of burning. The dates are coded as polygons so that you can actually map the progression of a fire from its ignition point across the landscape over time. Another common data format for spatial data is a raster. This is for gridded data, and it's usually stored in the TIFF format. This example data set shows above ground biomass at uh, one hectare grid cells for the island of Borneo. And if you zoom in on this, you can actually see that it is in a square grid. Within this grid, each of the colors in, in the grid cells represents a value for above ground biomass in, mil, in megagrams per hectare. So a raster grid contains a numeric data value in each grid cell. A geotiff is a file format uh, where the geolocation info or information is embedded within the file. The third type of um, geospatial data that we have at our DAC is called a NetCDF um, file format. The NetCDF format includes multi-dimensional data. You might think of it as a data cube. And an example of multi-dimensional NetCDF data is shown here. This data includes uh, DAMET weather data. Uh, including maximum daily temperature. And it's gridded across North America at one kilometer grid cell size or resolution. 
but the net PDF file format allows us to stack all 365 days within one year into one net PDF file. Now, if you want to learn more about net CDF data and this working with this file format, I encourage you to check out the link at the bottom of this slide. This is to a webinar we gave a while back about net CDF data, and it includes R scripts as well. Now, when you're dealing with geospatial data, one of the most important things to keep in mind is the geographic projection. This slide shows two different projections that are commonly used for data. The top figure shows the geographic projection. It's also referred to as geographic latitude and longitude. Basically, this projection just treats the latitude and longitude as an equally spaced rectangular grid. And it's a very common projection for simple maps and raster files, especially at a global um, extent. The second panel shows the Albers equal area projection. And you can see that um, the Albers projection distorts the shapes of some of the uh, land masses, especially in the southern hemisphere. But it preserves the relative area of land masses. Now, the Albers equal area projection is commonly used in the northern latitudes, especially in Alaska and Canada. And that's why it's actually used in the data set that we're going to talk about today. So the example data set we will use for our demonstration is um, an examination of forest carbon stocks, carbon emissions, and net carbon flux for the continental United States. It provides maps of these variables for the years 2006 to 2010. The researchers um, measured gross carbon emissions from land use conversion, um, insect damage, logging, wind, and weather events. And they made maps of these data at 100 meter spatial resolution and provided them in a geo-tip format in Albers North American projection. If you want to learn more about this data set, um, they published a paper in the journal Carbon Balance and Management at the link at the bottom of this slide. Now, to access this data, you can go to the ORNL DAC website. First of all, you would navigate to the landing page for this data set. It's provided here at this DOI link. And you would see a landing page that looks like this. You click the Sign In button at the top right. And you may need to create a free NASA Earth Data account and use it to sign in. Then you would scroll down the page to the list of data files. So if you scroll down, you'll see um, a table with gray boxes with the data files, and you'll click to download the two files used in this tutorial. Those are the gross emissions V101 USA insect and gross emissions V101 USA fire.tiff. You could click on those and download them. Notice that at the bottom of the landing page, you can also see um, a map of the data set. And this is provided by the Spatial Data Access Tool. You could click on this link to see the data and uh, visualize it before you were to download. Now in today's tutorial, we're going to use the programming language R to examine carbon emissions from two different disturbance types, fires and um, insect damage within three different states in the United States. Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. So we're going to read in the data, select the data within our study area of these three states. We're going to extract pixel values within that region, reclassify the data, and then combine the two rasters for fire and insect damage into one file. And finally, we're going to make a map, the end result being shown here on this slide.
Before we transition to the tutorial, I want to bring your attention to other resources on geospatial data in R. They're provided by Data Carpentry and the National Ecological Observatory Network. And both of these tutorials are really helpful for beginners um, in geospatial analysis. So um, I will direct your attention to this link again, which provides a um, tutorial in R. And I'll turn it over to Jessica to go through that tutorial with you. Thanks, Allison, and hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. So on your screen, you should see the ORNL DAC webpage. This is where the webinar and the associated tutorial will be hosted. As you scroll down, you can see there's an overview of the webinar. We also give information on the data set that we're going to be using and on the carbon monitoring system, which is the mission that funded this data set's work. Important to you is a section on the prerequisites. If you want to use this code on your own, you're going to have to download R. I also recommend that you download R Studio, which is a popular environment for executing R code. If you need to brush up on how to use R, you should also review these R manuals. As Allison told you before, in order to download our data, you must have a NASA Earth Data account or you need to log into your existing account. With the download data, uh, underneath download data, you can see two links that will directly download the two GeoTIFF files that we'll be using in the tutorial. Then for procedure, for the tutorial that we'll be doing today, we uh, have it in both R markdown format and regular markdown format. We also have a supplemental tutorial available on GitHub, which is going to give you a, a few more um, examples of different analyses that you can do for geospatial data in R. And then once this webinar is finished recording and uh, posted, we will also have a link to that there. So as I said, you can download the R markdown file, and then you can open the R Markdown file in R Studio and execute the code and view its rendering directly in the R Studio environment. But for today, we're going to look at the Markdown file, which is going to be rendered in GitHub so that you can view it. And so go ahead and click on that link if you're doing it at home, and it'll take you to this page. So this is GitHub. And if you scroll down, you can see the tutorial, and it consists of the code, the output of the code, and the commentary. So first, you're going to have to install and load packages. A lot of the functionality that we'll be using on R is already built in and installed when you install R. However, there are three packages that you will need to install and load to execute the exercises in this tutorial. They're the raster package, the rgdoll package, and the tigris package. If you use the install packages function, you'll also want to set your dependencies to true so that it'll download any other packages that are necessary to make these three packages run. You're also going to need to load the, uh, the packages into your R environment so that R can call the functions that are in those packages. I highly recommend that you set some options for the raster package. That includes progress equals text. And that's a really cool uh, functionality of this package because it'll actually show the progress of your code as it's running as a percentage. Also, the max memory will increase the memory allowance in your R environment. And the temp dir is going to allow you to specify what temporary um, directory or folder you'd like to store your large objects in. If you have any questions about the packages or any of the functions, you can try using the help or the args command. 
Now for loading the data. To begin, um, you want to be sure that you set your working directory using the setwd function and the file path where you save the data. Throughout this um, tutorial, we used the folder data, which you'll see. And with the raster function, you're going to want to load the two geotip files that Allison demonstrated. One you'll name fire, and the other one you'll name insect. And it's going to save these files and store them in the R environment as raster layer objects. You'll also use the function states, which is going to download a shapefile of the United States from the U.S. Census Bureau website. And it's going to store that as a spatial polygon data frame object. Now for our first section where we actually manipulate the files. You can notice here that uh, for each of these sections, we um, list the functions that are featured in this section, and we give you a little bit of information about it. You're going to begin by using the print function to view details about the internal data structure of our raster layer objects, beginning with fire. And throughout this tutorial, you'll see the code listed first, and then the output listed, typically with hashtags at the beginning. So when you look at the raster layer object we named fire, you can see that the class is a raster layer. You can see its dimensions, including the total number of cells across the entire extent of the grid. You'll see the resolution. So this one's 100 by 100 for each of those cells. The extent of the layer, the coordinate reference system, where the data is stored, where you're calling it from, the name of the layer, and also the values of the cell. So this shows you the minimum and the maximum value of the cells. And for this particular uh, object, the cells represent, or the values in the cells represent carbon emissions. Now we're going to use a command that's just going to call the coordinate reference system arguments of the fire object. If you look here, you'll see um, proj equals AEA, and this means the projection equals AEA, which stands for the Albers North America projection. And also it shows you units, and the units equal M, which means that the units are in meters. So if you look back at the resolution, which says it's 100 by 100, that means that each cell represents 100 by meters by 100 meters. They're going to use the plot function to make a simple image to represent the fire raster layer so we can visualize the carbon emissions from fire damage across the, for, um, the forest of the continental U.S. And according to the documentation for this data set, the gross carbon emissions were measured in megagrams of carbon per year per cell. So here in our code, we've told it what layer we want to plot, and we've told it what we want the main uh, title of the plot to be. We tell it what the label should be for the X and Y axes, so the horizontal extent is going to be in meters. We tell it what we want the legend to say, and so we want megagrams of carbon per year. And we also tell it what we want the, the NA values to be, or the NA cells to be colored at. So the NA cells are all the cells across the raster that do not have a value. And we made those black for this demonstration so that you can see the colors of the actual cells that are valued a bit better. So we're going to do the same thing. Uh, or actually, <laughs> we're going to move on to, um, to use the function CRS. And so CRS is going to uh, determine or is going to retrieve what the coordinate reference system arguments are for our objects. And identical is going to determine whether or not the fire layer and the insect layer have our, the same coordinate reference system. And they do. And so the coordinate reference system for the two raster layers are identical. So we can imagine them being in the same places geographically. And so now we're going to plot insect raster, but we're going to change the content of its main argument so that it says insect instead of fire. And so now if you squint your eyes, you can probably 
see the outline of the United States there. So next, we're going to select the data within our region of interest. That is, we're going to reduce the size of the fire and the insect rasters by choosing a smaller extent. And we're going to set that smaller extent using the spatial polygons data frame that we named my state. So for this, we're going to begin by printing what that looks like. And so and when we look at my states, we can see it's a spatial polygons data frame. And it has 56 features, which are rows of this data frame. You can think of each row as being its own polygon. It also has nine variables, which means columns. And then for names, you can see what the names are of all of those columns. columns. And you can also see the minimum and the maximum values for those columns. columns. For the name column, you can see Alabama and Wyoming. So those, that's the minimum value for name and the maximum value for name. For our exercise, we're going to focus on carbon emissions for the states Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. And we're going to use column referencing and indexing to select all column information, but only for three rows, or the polygons of the states we want. And we're going to name the new object three states. So in the code here, we're telling it that we want all the columns, but we only want rows from my states that have the name Idaho or Montana or Wyoming. And then we're going to look at what that new object looks like. So we can see it's still a spatial polygon data frame, but now there are only three rows, and there's the same number of columns. So what does it look like plotted? So now we see our three states. So we can get fire and insect data that occurs within the same extent of these three states, but we have to make sure that the three objects all share the same coordinate reference system so that they are going to match up on the coordinate plane. And again, we're going to use identical, this time using the fire raster um, as a reference, and then check it with the coordinate reference system against the coordinate reference system of three states. And we see that they do not have the same coordinate reference system. So now we're going to use the SP transform function, and we're going to change the three state coordinate reference system to match that of the fire raster layer. And we use this capital CRS to properly format how those, how those are going to look. So now when we plot trans states, we can see that it shifted a little bit. And that's because the orientation of the polygons are now fitting the Albers conical projection. So now that our objects share a coordinate reference system, we can compare the extent of fire and trans states. And so for the fire raster extent, you can see the minimum and maximum values here. And then for the polygon extent, you can see the minimum and maximum values here. And if you look closely, you can see that fire has a much larger extent than trans states. And so we're going to use the crop function to reduce the extent of our raster layer objects. And this is going to create a subset of the fire and insect rasters um, specified by the extent of trans states. And we're also going to name these new objects to um, reflect the manipulation we've done. And so this will take a few minutes to run. For those of you guys that are going to be running it on your own computers, I tried to give you notes to let you know uh, what to expect when you run the code. And so here we use the crop function, and we're going to crop the fire raster by the extent of the trans state polygon. And we're going to do that for both the fire raster and the insect raster. So now when we plot crop fire and crop insect, we're also going to plot trans state polygon on top of it so we can envision how the carbon emissions are distributed across the three states, give us a little bit of perspective. So here in the code, we've added plot trans state, and we've said add equals true so that the polygon is then plotted on top of the raster. You can see that for the fire damage and also for the insect damage. Now, if you look closely to the outsides of the polygons, you can see that there's still data there. So there's data about insect damage that's outside of the polygons. And that's because the crop function changed the extent of the raster's layers to match the polygon object. 
but because the polygon object is rotated, it doesn't fully take up that same extent. So we're going to use the mask function to get rid of all the values that are outside of the boundaries of the polygon. And you can see that we do this here. Again, we're using the mask function, and we're masking the crop fire raster layer that we made, and we're doing that with trans state polygon. Now when we plot, you can take a look and you can see that those extraneous values are now gone. Next, we're going to examine raster value summaries. And we're going to do this by comparing the three states by their carbon emissions, but we're only going to do that for fire damage. We're going to use the extract function, and what that's going to do is it's going to collect all the cell values of mask fire that occur within the extent of the trans state spatial polygon's data frame. Here, we use the extract function. We're extracting the mask fire values that occur within the trans state. And we're going to say df equals true, so that it's going to return an object that is in a data frame class. Then we're going to use the summary function so we can look at the distribution of those values. So there's two columns. The first one is ID, the minimum value of 1 and a maximum value of 3, because there are three different states we're looking at. One represents Idaho, two represents Montana, and three represents Wyoming. And here we can see the distribution of the cell values across those three states, minimum 2 to 333, and there are also many NAs. So on average, across these three states, there's a mean 56 megagrams of carbon per year that are a result of forest destruction by fire damage. But we don't want to see the fire damage for all the three states combined. We want to see them for um, the three states individually. So we're going to use the subset function, and we're going to split the data frame into three parts. And here in the code, we're saying we're going to subset that data frame. And how we're going to subset it is that we only want rows that equal 1 for the ID column, which corresponds with Idaho. And so now you see for I, the ID that there is only a minimum and maximum value of 1 because we only have Idaho. And now you can see the distribution of those cell values. However, this data frame is actually quite large and has more information than we need. So we only want the second column, and we don't want all of these NAs. And so now we're going to use the functions which and, and is NA to make a new object. So what we're saying is that we want to take that data frame we just made for Idaho, we want only the second column, and we want only rows that are not NA. And now, if you use summary, you can see that there's only one column. You can see the minimum and the maximum values, and there are no longer NAs. So we're going to do the same thing for Montana and Wyoming. And then we can compare the summaries across the three states. So on average, Montana has the highest carbon emissions, but the maximum carbon emissions for a single cell occurred in Idaho. In addition to summary, we can create graphs that will visualize the carbon emissions across these three states. And we're going to use that with the histogram function. And it's going to plot the frequency of cell values. So here we told R that the Y limit and the X limit should be the same for the three plots so that we can compare them. So plotting that, now we can see a visual representation of the megagrams of carbon per year um, from fire damage across these three states. In the next section, we're going to reclassify values of the raster. And we're going to do this in two different ways. So first, we're going to start with our mask fire raster. And we're going to use the calc function to code all the cells that have fire damage to now be two. 
So instead of the variation that we've seen uh, in the gross carbon emissions, now we're just going to have twos for any place where there was fire damage. So with the calc function here, we're going to calculate it for the mass fire raster, and we're going to define a function that says that for all the values in mass fire, if the value is greater than zero, then we're going to turn it into a two. So we can check if our class reclassification worked by using summary. And we can see now that the minimum value is two and the maximum value is two. So we only have twos or NAs. And when we plot that, all the cell values of this new reclass fire raster should be in the same locations as the max fire raster, but they'll only be a single value. We changed the plot title here to now say locations of forest disturbance from fire damage in our forest. And we've also colored all the points or all the cells red that have values. Now we're going to do the same thing for our mask insect raster, but we're going to use a different function. We're going to use the reclassify function here. And this uses a matrix to identify the target cell values we want to change and also what values we want to change those to. So here we use reclassify, we do it to the mask insect raster, and the matrix is saying that values from 1 to 285, that's the maximum number, we're going to change it to 1. And then when we use summary to check what, what it did, we can see now the minimum and the maximum value is the same. So all values for the new object is going to be either 1 or an NA. So plotting that, again, these values should be in the same locations as the previous raster, but they're going to be all one number. And we've col um, colored these dark green. So in the next section, we're going to combine two rasters. And just a little background here, the documentation for this data set tells us that there are no overlapping non-NA cells between the two raster layers. That is, if you were to combine the two raster layer objects, a cell could only take the value of either 2 in our case or 1, corresponding with fire or insect. Or it could be an NA. So in this case, we can use the cover function to combine these objects. And cover is unique because it'll replace all the NA values of the first raster layer we name with the non-NA values of the second one. So for our purposes, we're going to use reclass fire as the first layer, and then the second layer, reclass insect, is going to lay on top of that. And notice that this function is going to take a couple of minutes to run. Then we use summary to see what we did. So now we see the minimum value is 1, and the maximum value is 2. Now we can plot these together. And we're going to change some of the arguments so that it represents uh, what our data look like now. And so for the, the legend arguments, we're telling it that these colors represent disturbance where we want the scale to break, what colors we want to use, and also where we want to place the labels. So here, we can now see locations of forest disturbance across the three states. And we can see what red means, fire, and what insect means. And this is now contained in one single, single raster object. And a cell will either be 0, 1, or NA. Now we're going to reproject and write a raster. So reprojecting a raster in R is different than transforming the coordinate reference system as we did for the polygon earlier in the exercise. To reproject, we have to use the project raster function and the capital CRS function to correctly format the, reproject, the projection information. This will take several minutes to run to change uh, the projection information. Then we can print the object to take a look. We still have a raster layer. We can see how many cells we have now. And we can see the resolution has changed. And our coordinate reference system has changed. We've changed it to the long lat or the typical uh, geographic system uh, projection, WGS84. And this uses, 
uses the unit degree, um, decimal degrees. And you can also see that the values are either 1 or 2. Now when we plot it, we're going to slightly change the arguments again. We're going to zoom in to the three states a little bit, and we're going to change what our axes say because we've changed uh, the coordinate reference system. So now we see longitude and latitude on the axes, and the longitude and latitude is way more intuitive for most people because uh, the longitude and latitude is usually uh, used in most GPS systems. So now we're going to write the raster so that we can save this raster to our data directory. And we're going to save it in TIFF format so that it's a GeoTIFF and it stores all the geographic information of the raster layer object um, to be retrievable outside of R. So we use the write raster function, we tell it what the object is, and then we tell it the file name and where we want that to be stored. Then we can use the file exist function just to make sure that it did save the object where we expected it to. Next we're going to export the plot as a PNG and the raster as a KML. So to save that final plot we use the PNG function. And this function is going to open a graphics device that's going to save the plot we run in a PNG format. We also need to use the deb off function to tell R when we're finished plotting and we want to close the graphics device. You can see that demonstrated here. With PNG, we tell it the width and the resolution of the PNG that we want to make. We have the same plot as what we've demonstrated before, and we use deb off to tell R when we're finished. We're also going to save the raster in a KML format, which stands for Keyhole Markup Language, and this is the notation that was developed for geographic visualization in Google Earth. And we're also going to make sure that it tells us when it, if it's been written to the data directory. So for KML, again, you tell it what the object is, where it's going, and we're also going to tell it the colors we repre want represented, so dark green for ones and red for, for twos. And we can see here that it saved. So this is the end of the main part of the tutorial. If you like this tutorial, please let us know on Twitter or on Facebook. And if you'd like to make suggestions for a new tutorial, you can email us. Don't forget that there's also a supplemental document included on GitHub that offers two additional sections. It'll tell you how to perform a focal analysis and get the coordinates of the cells, which can be uh, very useful. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Okay, thanks, Jessica. So at this point, what we will do is we'll transition to a final set of polling questions. <clears throat> there have been quite a few questions um, asked, uh, so not to worry because that's the, the Q&A is a persistent feature. Hopefully, we'll be able to address all of those in the next you know, three or four minutes. Um, and uh, there were some repeat questions, so we'll get started with the Q&A in about three minutes or so. All right, thanks everybody. What we should do is go ahead and transition to the Q&A. There are quite a few questions, <clears throat> so let's do that. And um, if you give me just a moment here, I want to move up to the first question that was asked. Uh, let's see, so the first question was, are the data for carbon emission available for Bangladesh in the provided link? So this was really kind of a, toward the beginning of, of the uh, demo, I believe. So either Allison or Jess. Thanks, Jennifer. I'll answer that. Um, unfortunately, the data set that we used as an example does not include any other countries outside the United States. Okay, thank you. Let's see here, I need to. The next question is, how reliable are the NEON and Carpentry data as compared to the ORNL DAC data holdings? Yeah, thank you, Ian, for asking. Um, with those two links, I was referring to just their um, training materials and tutorials, and their tutorials are very good. They're excellent. So I would highly recommend those. Um, NEON also has data available, and um, 
I'm not that familiar with it, but I believe it to be high quality. Okay, thank you, Allison. So our next question is, will there be any differences running this R code in Jupyter Notebook versus the uh, R markdown environment that you were demonstrating today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there, those two versions are exactly the same. So you can use the .md, which is the markdown. You can use that in a Jupyter Notebook or you can use the RMD, which is R Markdown, and they're just two copies of the same content that you can use in different settings. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Allison. So the next question is, uh, and this was part, this, this, many of these questions were asked during the demo, um, and so uh, one of the questions was, there was a link that, it, that indicated you should install the TGDAL package, but it's actually an RGDAL package. Did you say, speak to that? Yes, yes, it is RGDAL. Um, I'm not sure where that typo might have been, but um, on the README of GitHub, also on our website landing page for the webinar, it says, or should say, RGDAL and give you a link to the CRAN page for that package. And in our actual tutorial, the code, it should also say RGDAL. But I will double check, see if that was a typo, and correct that um, on GitHub. Thank you. So thanks very much for bringing this to our attention. And then the next question is, how do you handle objects with differing CRS? And there are were, there were actually a couple of questions on that topic. Yeah, if you have a couple of objects that have a different coordinate reference system, I would first begin to think about where you uh, most want the data represented. So as Allison demonstrated, if you want the data, the geographic location of your data to be most representative of uh, and preserve spatial area for somewhere in the higher latitudes, like in the US or Canada, or Alaska, then you would maybe want to try the Albers coordinate or the Albers projection. However, if you are interested in another area on the Earth, like along the equator, you might want to try the UTM projection or coordinate system. It really is dependent upon where you intend for your map to show the data. And once you know that, then you can change your objects to whatever coordinate reference system or projection you need. Okay, thank you, Jess. The next question is uh, with respect to um, wanting to know whether or not they, the, the participants will be provided links to the platforms that share the scripts and help to solve scripts, uh, ru problems running scripts. So on our ORNL DAC webpage, we will have links to the GitHub. We, you can also access it. If you are familiar with GitHub, you can look up the ORNL DAC and find them listed there. And it will include the RMD version of the tutorial and the supplemental, and it will include the MD version of the tutorial and the supplemental. And the README file for that GitHub repository also uh, will describe the links. And if there are questions about running particular lines of code, those can be directed to the ORNL DAC as well, but make sure you alert them to the fact that you watch this webinar and you have a question specifically uh, for the presenters of the webinar. Okay, great. Thank you, Jess. And so uh, in the web resources uh, link pod, directly below the Q&A, the first link that's labeled Geospatial Analysis and R Webinar Resources, that will take you to the page that Jess has just described. Um, and I also copied and pasted the individual link within the Q&A pod for all of you. So our next question is, um, you are working, well, it's kind of a comment as well. You are working with the area of spatial and space-time statistics, question mark. One of the strengths of R is its statistical capacity. Um, that's, that's right. R is really good for doing statistics. Um, one of the things that we wanted to demonstrate in this 
tutorial today was actually the extended capabilities of R to do geospatial processing. And so uh, once you have your data, like Jessica demonstrated, for each of those three states, she extracted the cell values from the raster across each of those three states and stored them in three data frames. And she showed three plots of what those histograms look like. Once you have those data, you could do a variety of statistical analyses, like uh, a test for significance, or um, you could compare them against some other uh, values for uh, another geographic area. But we weren't really demonstrating statistical analysis today. All right, thank you, Allison. Okay, so the next question is, are there any big differences between R and Google Earth Engine when it comes to performing GIS or remote sensing analysis? That's a good question. Um, there are a few differences. Um, with Google Earth Engine, you can do geospatial data processing um, on the Google Cloud platform itself. So you don't have to download data. And um, you use a JavaScript programming language in Google Earth Engine to basically um, tell it what you want to do, like if you want to extract data across a spatial region of interest. However, not all of the data that you might be interested in is on Google Earth Engine, and so you would have to load that data onto the cloud. With R, um, you can ex execute your scripts on a local machine or local server. So you have to have a copy of all the data that you want to examine, and you write the script in the R language. So they're really two different um, methods and two different platforms for processing, although you can do similar types of analyses in both. Okay, thank you, Allison. Uh, the next question is, uh, why not, and this was, again, part of the, the question uh, arose during the demo, why not reclassify with mask fire, and then in brackets, mask fire greater than zero, and closed brackets, less than negative two. Hi. Yeah, um, I think what this question demonstrates is the versatile nature of R coding. So using the R language, you can do many different, or many of the same functions many different ways. And so, for instance, with the mask uh, and the crop functions, you can do those in either order. And what I was trying to demonstrate today with the code is really what the functions are doing and put that in the perspective of a, of a real data set. However, you could rewrite the code to include a lot of those analyses all in one line. But I separated them out for a proof of concept. And so, yes, you can code it many different ways. Um, if I were coding this for myself, for analyses that no one would ever look at, I would definitely make the code a little bit different and uh, not as explanatory. So thanks for your question. Okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, Jess. The next question is, what are the pros and cons of using calc versus reclassify? Yeah, um, it, it's really, I guess I would say, preference uh, right now. Um, the matrix of reclassify enables you to put the values from to and the changed value all in a matrix. With the function, though, you have to write a more sophisticated code uh, that is a little, takes a little bit more um, advanced skills. And so I would say the reclassify with the matrix is much easier if you want to do many different value changes. And the function, or the calc with the, the function written in it for maybe just a small number of changes. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jess. The next question is, what happens when there are two pixels with values in this case? And then the, um, 
additional comment is using the cover. So what happens yeah, when there's great are question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great question. So because I knew uh, how these uh, values were distributed, I, I knew that I needed to use the cover function. If you had values that were at the same location, then you could do simple raster algebra. And so let's say that you want to overlay the insect raster on top of the, the fire raster, and you know that fire values are 2 and insect values are 1. When you add those together, then you know if they both had a value there that the resultant value of the raster is now going to be 3. And so that's how one way that you could combine them. Um, the problem with adding them together is often the NA values. And so the cover function is unique in that it will replace an NA value. However, it's not as easy when you do the raster algebra because you can't add an NA value with a cell value. And if you look at the supplemental tutorial, I actually go into focal analysis, and it also involves raster algebra, so adding two rasters together. And I provide both a, a dummy, uh, dummy data, which is a small raster uh, that I made up that we use to demonstrate how these functions work. And then we perform those same functions on the actual rasters that we used in the main part of the tutorial. So I, I recommend you take a look at that. OK, thank you, Jess. <clears throat> OK, so let's see here. OK, how many variables can you put into a TIFF pixel? Can you put float values in as well? Um, that's a good question. So um, if you have a raster that has one band, a band is basically a layer, um, then you can only put one value in each grid cell. Um, but yes, you can have floating point numbers, uh, or you can have integers, like in this data set that we showed today. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly how many other different types of encoding you can have in a raster cell. But to expand on that a little, you can have a raster file with more than one band. It's called a multi-band geotiff. And so you could have, uh, we could have combined, for example, the fire and the insect damage into one geotiff, but that's not really uh, a good data uh, management practice because then it's possible you might forget what band one is versus band two um, and it's not written down anywhere. And so the best practice for us is to keep the geotiff to a single band each. And I'll add on to that that the raster package that we used in the tutorial, if you look at its documentation, it'll describe how you can make stacks and bricks of rasters, which are essentially multiple layers. OK, thank you. All right, the next question is, OK, so <clears throat> one of the participants had asked, because I was just getting ready to um, type up an answer, where the data recipes and tutorials are stored. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so one, one location would be at our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel, and I'll type this in in just a moment, and you can find it to the left. And then there are additional R and Python data recipes or tutorials at the, not only at the ORML DAC <coughs> website, which you'll see below in the web resources link, but also at the land processes website, um, land processes DAC website, which I will include when I type up, finish typing up my answer here. Um, <clears throat> so let's, my, my apologies, having a few allergies here. <laughs> All right, let me just um, send this off, and then we can move on to the next question. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so the next question is, 
When reprojecting rasters, how do you specify a snap raster to ensure proper alignment, and how do you specify the resampling method? Okay, so for that question, I cannot answer off the top of my head. <laughs> I would need to take a look at the raster package, and so this is actually um, a good point for me to, to point out. So I highly recommend to use this tutorial um, as starter code. And so what I do when I'm coding is, uh, if I don't know how to write the code myself, I'll usually use Google to try to find people who have had similar problems. And a lot of times they've posted their code to do this. And so I'll start with that and then I'll change the arguments of the functions they wrote to see how it changes the output. And then I'll start reading about the packages uh, and the functions to see if there are any additional arguments I can add or other uh, functions that work better. And so for that particular question, I can not give you an answer, but I do think that given the starter code you have here that you could um, easily start to identify uh, the best way to, to go about doing that using the documentation of the packages. Okay, thank you. All right, let me um, move up here a little bit here. Okay, where can we find data in JSON and GeoJSON files format? Um, that's a good question. Um, we don't typically support um, distributing data from uh, NASA's Earth Science Program in a GeoJSON format. Um, however, I do know that you can um, use R to translate raster data, for example, into GeoJSON. Uh, you can translate from KML files to GeoJSON. And so that's uh, becoming a more widely used format, but uh, I wouldn't say that we necessarily have any code or any uh, methodology for it. Okay, thank you, Allison. Our next question, and of course, we have moved into the extended Q&A at this point uh, in time. Um, we will have a hard cutoff at 3.15, so we'll try to get to um, the remainder of the questions during the Q&A session. However, if we don't get to your question, please know that we'll be able to address those questions. Our speakers can email you offline with an answer. Okay, so the next question is, in your experience, which is the most efficient way on R of working with HDF or a NetCDF file, such as the Meritu data set? Hey, uh, that's a great question. Um, we gave a webinar back in 2017 about that exact topic, about how to open NetCDF, and HDF is the same um, in R. So I suggest if you look at the files that um, you can download from Adobe Connect right now, the presentation files, you'll see a link to that NetCDF uh, webinar, which is still online and it's still uh, live on GitHub as well, and you can go there for more information. All right, great, thank you. The next question is, do you have to check the grid cells of two rasters are aligned or match? Yeah, I would highly recommend doing it. So for, for these particular rasters, I knew from the documentation provided on our website where you download the files, I knew that they were in the same projection and I knew a lot of other things about it. However, I demonstrated how you would do that in this tutorial because it is common and it is necessary. So I can tell you that if you have two files and you don't know what their coordinate reference systems are, you need to figure it out because if you try to plot them on top of each other, it will not work if they have a different coordinate reference system. And you'll wonder why you have one plot and a blank page for the other. And so for it to understand in, in a coordinate 
uh, system or coordinate plane where to plot the objects relative to each other, they need to be on the same coordinate reference system. And so that's why I demonstrated in the code how to do that. OK, great. Thank you, Jess. The next question is, uh, I thought I saw a third Tigris package in your online demo, but it is not listed on GitHub. Is it needed? The or Tigris Tigris? package is available in R. Um, I would not find it through GitHub. I would find it through CRAN. So CRAN is the network that lists all the packages for R. So if you're in the R environment, you can install Tigris uh, right using the install packages uh, function. And you can also Google it, Tigris package, and then CRAN, C-R-A-N, together. And it will bring up, what I'm sure the first hit should be the documentation for that package. But I wouldn't recommend going to GitHub to try to find it. OK, thanks, Jess. <clears throat> the next question is, um, how can you find an approximate relationship between atmospheric carbon and carbon emission? For example, the IPCC scenario, such as 260 parts per million and 360 parts per million with emission rate. Or can you find an approximate relationship? Hey, um, that is a good question. <laughs> and more, I think, of a research question than a data processing one. So um, I can't really answer that online today, but I will follow up with the person who asked okay. it uh, via email. OK, and thank you, Allison. Oh, Jennifer, if I can go back, I just want to, Allison and I were wondering if I answered the previous question correctly um, about the Tigris package. I just wanted to also add, if the question was what the Tigris package was used for, it was only used for the states function, where we downloaded the shapefile of the United States from the US Census Bureau. OK, so if this question was not answered, and you feel like the, the answer did not address your question, if the user could provide um, feedback in the Q&A pod, that would be helpful. Um, and let's go ahead and move on. We've got about five minutes left for, for questions here. Um, what computational limitations will I encounter when processing big data sets, for example, a time series? Is time series analysis reasonable to do? Um, is it, I guess, is it reasonable to conduct, you know, to complete time series analysis in R on a local computer, or will I need a supercomputer? Well, that's a good question. Um, this. So for example, it just depends on what type of data and how large the data files are. So for this data set, it's uh, across the United States at 100 meters. So it's high resolution at a continental scale. You can still do this type of analysis on a laptop. Uh, but if you're starting to have like multiple time series, um, monthly or yearly, and maybe you have 30 or 40 different time points or more, then you're starting to push the limit of what you can do on a local machine. And you might need to uh, use a bigger or more powerful computer. That being said, uh, GeoTIFF is not necessarily the recommended format for looking at time series. Um, if I was approaching that question and I had a global data set that I wanted to do time series analysis, I would first transform the data into a NetCDF format, which, as I mentioned, is a data cube. So you can have space on two dimensions, x and y, and then you can have the z-axis being the time series. And NetCDF has internal compression and a lot of other cool functionality that would enable you to do time series analysis. And it would probably be um, compact enough to be supported on a laptop or desktop machine. So I would think about the format as well when you're looking at um, crunching big data. OK, thank you, Allison. Uh, there was a comment uh, made that 
one of the participants, we're getting an error after installing Tigris saying package or namespace load failed. That's interesting. Um, the, I, I, there's a, a handful of reasons why that could be. The first one that comes to my head is that whatever CRAN repository they're downloading from might not be updated with the latest packages. So whenever I am setting up R, um, I choose a repository for CRAN that I know is very popular, like UC Berkeley or something like that, so that you know whatever new packages have been added, they have been updated uh, on CRAN and are accessible to your machine. And so the person could try Googling uh, setting up CRAN repository for R and see how they can change their settings. Um, sometimes uh, you'll have a repository that may be nearer to you geographically, but it's not updated regularly, so it might not be your best option. So choose uh, a university or something repository that is, you know is really popular. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we really have time for one more question in the extended Q&A. Um, and if we did not get to your question, there, there's actually quite a few. Um, rest assured that our speakers will be in touch with you offline to answer these questions. So the final question is really, it's more of a comment and I think it's important. So one of our participants has mentioned that you should also point out some of the R disadvantages. Okay, so I'll start uh, just as devil advocate. Uh, the reason R is so great is that it is open source and that it's also sourced by their user community. So certain functions that you might need to run, you don't actually have to code them yourself. Other people who might be experts on certain type of analyses or field of research can write those functions for you and make them available. The downsides to R, uh, it's pretty much with any coding environment, it's difficult to learn. There's a very uh, steep learning curve. And so I first learned how to do GIS on, uh, in ArcGIS. And so I was able to point and click and very quickly uh, you know, monitor whether or not I was seeing what I expected. It was a lot easier as a beginner to, uh, you know, read all the options or point and click to all the options and then filter out, you know, all the options based upon what I needed. Whereas in R, you're starting more with a clean slate and then adding the information that you know you need. And so there are the disadvantages in that sense. Um, R isn't necessarily going to tell you um, every single time you do something wrong. It will often give you an output, even if the output is wrong, it, it might coerce it uh, to give you an output. And so you have to have an understanding of what you're doing um, to, to make sure it's right. And so in the tutorial, I tried to um, explain with code why I was doing such things. Um, but I typically, in my own analyses, I test with additional code to make sure that the output I'm getting is what's expected. And so yes, there, it's a very steep learning curve, uh, but I think it's one worth tackling because once you start to understand the R language, you can use R for statistics, for diagramming, uh, and, and all kinds of other uses. Okay, well at this point I'd like to thank all of our participants for uh, joining us this afternoon and also our speakers um, for, for the, this great webinar. You've had some really excellent feedback. Unfortunately, we did not, we ran out of time to address all of the questions. However, again, we will follow up offline um, with the questions that were unanswered today. Um, just to draw your attention really quickly, uh, we have the URLs are listed in the web resources where you can find a link to GitHub, the very first 
um, a link in the web resources pod below the Q&A. NASA Earth Data Search is a uh, data discovery access and ordering um, tool where you can search across all of the NASA Earth Science or EOS DACs. And then the, the Oak Ridge DAC homepage is listed below that, and the NASA Earth Data um, webpage is directly below that. The, the PowerPoint file at the bottom of the page is in the presentation file pod, if you, as well as the agenda. If you click on um, either one of those two files, you'll be prompted with an option to download the file. Again, we did record today's webinar, and I will send out a link to those recordings to everyone who registered for today's uh, webinar. <clears throat> and uh, at this point, what we will do is we will log off from the audio component, and I will leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes or so if you think about any follow-up questions. All right, so thanks to everybody, and I hope to see you at an upcoming webinar. Actually, our next webinar will be held on March 28th, and we'll focus on the new EcoStress uh, mission. So if that interests you, if you go to earthdata.nasa.gov, you'll see an announcement with a regi uh, registration link. Um, and also, uh, you can, within that announcement, you'll find information to sign up to receive future announcements for these data discovery and access webinars. All right, everybody. Uh, Allison and Jess, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for spending roughly, at this point, I guess, uh, you know, an hour and 15 minutes with us. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll log off from the audio component, and I'll leave the virtual meeting space open um, for a few minutes. All right, thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Allison. Bye, Jess.